I'm David Sandbeck. I'm running for Congress in Minnesota's 4th Congressional District, and I want to share with you um, an article called The uh, Military Industrial Virus. It's by uh, Andrew Cockburn, a reporter, and uh, he's currently um, Washington uh, editor at uh, Harper's Magazine. And so uh, I thought it was such a, a great article. I want to share with you its content. And um, it goes, uh, for a country that spends such vast sums on its national security apparatus, many times more than the enemies that uh, supposedly threaten it do, the United States has a strangely invisible military establishment. Military bases tend to be located far from major population centers. The Air Force uh, has a vast missile field, uh, for instance, that are hidden away from the plains of the uh, northern Midwest. And it's rare to see uh, service uniforms on the streets of major cities, even Washington. Donald Trump did dream of holding a beautiful military parade down Pennsylvania Avenue, complete with a lot of planes going over and a lot of military might. But the Pentagon nixed the scheme by putting out the word that the extravaganza would cost $92 million. The estimate was certainly inflated. It was four times greater in real dollars than the price tag for the 1991 Gulf War victory parade, suggesting that the military prefers a low profile. It often takes an informed eye to appreciate signs of defense dollars at work, such as the office parks abutting uh, Route 28 south of Dulles Airport heavily populated with innocuously titled military intelligence firms. Largely out of sight, our gargantuan military machine is also increasingly out of mind, especially when it comes to the ways in which it spends and misspends our money. Three decades ago, revelations that the military was paying $435 for a hammer and $640 for an aircraft toilet seat ignited widespread media coverage and public outrage. But when it emerged in 2018 that the Air Force was now paying $10,000 for a toilet seat cover alone, the story generated little more than a few scattered news reports and some, de and some divisive commentary on blogs and social media. This was despite a senior Air Force official's unblushing explanation that the ridiculous price was required to save the manufacturer from losing revenue and profit. The Air Force now claims to have uh, 3D printed covers for $300 a piece. Still an extravagant sum for a toilet seat. Representative Ro Khanna of California, a leading light in the Congressional Progressive Caucus, who has spearheaded the fight to end U.S. participation in the Saudi War of Extermination in Yemen, uh, explained recently that uh, he sees this, endeavor, this indifference as a sign of the times. There's such cynicism about politics such cynicism about institutions, Rokana said, that the shock value of scandals that uh, in the past would have been disqualifying has been diminished. Um, uh, Rokana had discussed another um, apparent defense ripoff in which a company called Transdigum had been deploying a business model pioneered by the pharmaceutical industry. Transdigum seeks out unique suppliers of obscure but essential military components, such as a simple cable assembly, and buys the firm, and quickly boosts the component's price by 355% in the case of, uh, of uh, the assembly. Rokana was particularly depressed that the Defense Department's Inspector General, whom he, and along with Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, and Ohio Representative Tim Ryan had prompted to investigate the company. Uh, and they had concluded that Transdigum's ways of doing business was, in his words, awful but legal. Unsurprisingly, Wall Street loves the company. Its stock price has doubled in the two years since Rokana first raised the issue. At a time when defense spending accounts for 53 cents out of every dollar appropriated by Congress, one might hope that the Pentagon would be under increased scrutiny by those who believe that the money is urgently needed elsewhere. 
Yet this is evidently not the case. Outrageous examples, such as the toilet seat cover or trans digum, uh, come and go almost without comment, as does the ongoing trillion dollar overhaul of the United States nuclear arsenal, which surely poses a greater existential threat to the planet as climate change. True, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Tulsi Gabbard, among the Democratic presidential contenders, had been campaigning for cuts in defense spending, but they've all uh, have spotty records when it comes to votes on the military bills and, and budgets. Uh, the Progressive Caucus in the House of Representatives has indeed pressed for a freeze on Pentagon's budget, along with greater accountability and transparency in our Department of Defense. But the former effort has been stymied by opposition from centrist Democrats, and the centrist Democrats' uh, demands lack specifics. Um, Justice Democrats, a leftist pack that has recently emerged as a force behind the newly elected progressives, such as uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ariana Presley, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Talab, offers little detail on their defense policy uh, in its published platform beyond pledging uh, to end unnecessary wars and nation building. When Cockburn asked Rokana, what it means to be progressive on defense, Rokana responded with similar language. It means, he answered, to understand that our recent unconstitutional wars have not made America safe, that our military is overstretched, that we are in too many battlefields overseas, that we need greater restraint in the use of our military. For Rokana, the fault clearly lies with our aggressive foreign policy. The reason the military budget is bloated, he continued, is because we've got too large a presence and footprint overseas in a way that isn't making us safer. But why should a handful of comparatively small-scale operations overstretch a military with the largest budget since World War II? All indications are that the actual reason behind the military's bloated budget goes far beyond the ill-starred ventures of 21st century presidents, and as far more serious implications uh, for our defense and our society. In 1983, Chuck Spinney, a 37-year-old analyst uh, in the Pentagon's Office of Program Analysis and Evaluation, testified to Congress that the cost of the ever more complex weapons that the military insisted on buying was always growing many times faster than the overall defense budget um, and in consequence uh, the planes, ships, and tanks were never replaced on a one-to-one -one basis which in turn ensured that the armed forces got smaller and older. Planes, for instance, were kept in service far longer uh, and over far longer periods of time uh, and were maintained in poor states and in, in poor states of repair uh, owing to their increasing complexity and as to be expected the high command did not react favorably to these truths they allowed Spinney to keep his job but stopped assigning him anything of importance he spent the rest of his career ensconced in a pentagon office at the heart of the military industrial machine pondering and probing its institutional personality. Retiring in 2003, he maintained a steady outpost of pungent analysis of its workings. In 2011's essay, The Domestic Roots of Perpetual War, he discussed the pattern of military belief systems and distorted financial incentives that produced a voracious appetite for money, and it's sustained by a self-serving flood of ideological propaganda delivering, um, you know, uh, diving deep into the historical details of Pentagon spending, Spinney illustrated his analysis in the form of intricate charts that not only track the actual dollar amounts expended, but also showed how our projected budgets for various ambitious weapons-buying plans had never materialized, at least never to the degree necessary to buy the projected number of weapon systems. Hence, the shrinking forces. Late in 2018, Spinney's longtime friend, uh, Perry Spray, a former Pentagon whiz kid revered for uh, 
co-designing the highly successful A-10 and F-16 warplanes, a trenchant critic of defense orthodoxy suggested to Spinney that he add a novel tweak to his work by depicting budget changes from year to year in terms of percentages rather than dollar amounts. The analysis that Spinney produced at Spry's suggestion revealed something intriguing. Although the United States defense budget clearly increased and decreased over 60 years following the end of the Korean War, the decreases never dipped below where the budget would have been if it had simply grown at a 5% per year from 19, uh, 1954 on, with one minor exception in the 1960s. Amazingly, emphasized Spinney, this behavior even held true for the large budget reductions that occurred after the end of the Vietnam War, and more significantly, after the end of the Cold War. It's as if there is a rising floor of resistance below which the defense budget does not penetrate. Only during Obama's second term did the first dip below this level with any degree of significance. Even more interestingly, Every single time the growth rate had bumped against that floor, there had been an immediate and forceful reaction in the form of high-volume public outcry regarding a supposedly eminent military threat. Such bouts of threat inflation invariably induced a prompt remedial increase in budget growth, regardless of whether the proclaimed threat actually existed. As General Douglas MacArthur had remarked as far back as 1957, always there has been some terrible evil at home or some monstrous foreign power that was going to gobble us up if we did not blindly rally behind it by furnishing the exorbitant sums demanded. Yet, in retrospect, these disasters never seem to have happened, never seem to have been quite real." End quote. In 1960, for example, as President Eisenhower was getting ready to denounce the dangerous power of what he called the military-industrial complex, the growth rate was pressing against the 5% floor. On cue, there appeared a fraudulent specter of a missile gap favoring the Soviets. The incoming Kennedy administration duly opened a budgetary tap. A slowdown a few years later as Kennedy tried to apply the brakes and free up some money for domestic initiatives was reversed under Johnson with the first major escalation in Vietnam. The end of that war brought the rate down to 5%. True to form, there arose a chorus of alarms about the rising menace of Soviet military power. The CIA upwardly revised its estimates of enemy weapons prowess and spending. The Pentagon asserted that our nuclear forces faced a window of vulnerability. The consequent spend-up uh, accelerated sharply in the Reagan years, ultimately peaking at a record growth rate of 10%. The end of the Cold War, which had underpinned the entire enterprise, might have been expected to bring a change. But no, the 5% limit held firm. And before long, the growth rate rose again as Clinton expanded NATO, thereby ensuring tense relations with Russia for the foreseeable future. Uh, the September 11th attacks and the Bush-Obama wars pushed the year-on-year -year increases into overdrive until the rate dipped slightly below the 5% line in 2015. Donald Trump, for all his bombast about restoring the military, was at first apparently unwilling to undo this particular aspect of the Obama legacy. His initial budget plan for 2020 even featured an absolute decline in spending from 217 billion to uh, I, from 717 billion to 700 billion. This aberration was brief, however. Following outcry from the military's representatives in Congress, Trump reversed course and dutifully boosted the projected amount to $750 billion, just shy of the historical status quo. Now that the Democratic establishment long wedded to the notion that Vladimir Putin somehow engineered the election of Donald Trump, we have become 
as obsessively hawkish on the subject of Russia as any Republican, it seems likely that the line will soon climb north of 5% and stay there for years to come. Reports that the Russians, despite having a defense budget less than a tenth the size of ours, are somehow outpacing us in the development of weapons such as chemical hypersonic missiles go largely unchallenged. Moscow's latest submarines, ships, tanks, cyber weapons, and supposed mastery of hybrid warfare are regularly invoked to justify a level of spending that, even accounting for inflation, now runs almost double the Cold War average. This entire process whereby spending growth slows and then is seemingly automatically regenerated raises an interesting possibility that our military-industrial complex has become, in Spinney's words, a living organic system with a built-in self-defense reflex that reacts forcefully whenever a threat to its food supply, our money, hits a particular trigger point. The implications are profound, suggesting that the military-industrial complex is embedded in our society to such a degree that it cannot be dislodged, and also that it could be said to be concerned exclusively with self-preservation and expansion, like a giant, malignant virus. This, of course, is contrary to the notion that our armed forces exist to protect us against foreign enemies and impose our will around the globe, and that corruption, mismanagement, and costly foreign wars are anomalies that can be corrected with subtle reforms and changes in policy. But if we understand that the military-industrial complex exists purely to sustain itself and grow, it becomes easier to make sense of the corruption, mismanagement, and war, and understand why, despite warnings over allegedly looming threats, we remain, in reality, so poorly defended. The latter point may seem counterintuitive, Pentagon critics like Rokana tend to focus on the misuse of our military power, such as the wars in Yemen or Afghanistan, and on the need to reallocate money away from defense to address pressing social needs. These are certainly valid approaches, but they overlook the fact that we've been left with a very poor fighting force for our money. The evidence for this is depressingly clear. Starting with our bulging arsenal of weapon systems, incapable of performing as advertised, and bought at extraordinary cost. Some examples, such as the F-35 Lightning II fighter plane, bought by the Air Force, Navy, and Marines, has achieved a certain muted notoriety, and served as the occasional butt of jokes made by comedians on cable TV. Yet there is little public appreciation for the extent of the disaster. The F-35 first saw combat just the other year, 17 years after the program began. The Marines spent just six of, uh, just sent just six of them to their first deployment to the Middle East, and over several months only managed to fly, on average, one combat uh, per plane every three days. According to the Pentagon's former chief testing official, there had been opposition. These fighters could not have survived without protection from other planes. The most expensive weapons program in history, a project that cost over $400 billion, the F-35 initially carried a radar whose frequent freezing required the pilot to regularly switch it on and off. The radar problem was eventually corrected. The Air Force version of the plane still features an unacceptably inaccurate gun that remains to be fixed, though the Air Force claims to be working on it. The Navy is possibly in worse shape. Mines, to take one striking example, are a potent naval... Mines, to take one example, are a potential naval weapon and ubiquitous among our potential enemies. Fear of mines caused the United States to cancel a major amphibious landing during the Korean War, and concerns over possible Iraqi mines prevented a planned seaborne assault on Kuwait during the 1991 Gulf War. A single mine, and Iran has thousands of them, in the Strait of Hormuz, um, 
through which a third of the world's oil is transported by sea passes every day, would throw markets into total chaos. Yet the Navy currently possesses a mere 11 minesweepers, dilapidated vessels long past retirement age, with just four available for the entirety of the Middle East. Fifteen of the new and failure-ridden class of littoral combat ships, known, uh, uh, known to crews as little crappy ships, will supposedly be dedicated to mine hunting and mine sweeping, but none of their specialized equipment designed to detect and disable mines, including underwater drones, has been found to work. A July 2018 report from the Defense Department's Inspector General found the Navy's deployment of relevant systems prior to demonstrating that, that the systems were effective uh, asked a comment, the Navy nevertheless claimed that everything works, uh, or as in the case of the underwater drone, insisted they are on track to produce something that does. Thus, the lion's share of our defenses against mines must be borne by a small, decaying fleet of MH-53E helicopters that search and destroy mines by uh, a towering, large, sensor-laden sled through the ocean. The MH-53E and its variant for the Marines, the CH-53E, are lethal machines. Lethal, that is, to those who operate them. According to the journalist behind the documentary, Who Killed Lieutenant Van Dorn, the hospitals have crashed 58 times and killed 132 crew and contractors since their introduction in the 1980s, making them the most dangerous aircraft in the United States military. The Navy's shortcomings have been most vividly highlighted by the plethora of scandals in the Seventh Fleet, which operates in the Western Pacific. In recent years, Leonard Glenn Francis, a contractor known as Fat Leonard, who served the fleet's port visits around Asia and held over 200 million in contracts was found to have been bribing a wide range of officers, among them senior admirals with lavish entertainment including drunken parties that lasted days and featured a group of prostitutes known as the SEAL, uh, known as the Thai SEAL team, as well as cash. Uh, to, uh, to secure overpriced contracts. It has also emerged that fleet movements had at times been dictated not by the Navy's strategic requirements, but by officers repaying Francis's hospitality by directing ships to ports where he stood to make the most money. Though whistleblowers had been sounding the alarm for years, their complaints were routinely suppressed by officers on Francis's payroll. When the Navy finally got around to investigating his activities in 2010, no fewer than 60 admirals fell under suspicion. To date, 16 officers serving and retired have been found guilty of bribery, fraud, and related crimes, while a further 12 are awaiting trial. Another 550 active duty and retired military personnel were investigated, although the statute of limitations uh, precluded uh, prosecution in some cases. Meanwhile, the fleet itself has been progressively deteriorating as become, uh, 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 and uh, has uh, become tragically evident when two destroyers, the USS Fitzgerald and the USS John McCain collided with uh, a merchant vessel in Asian waters uh, in 2017, leaving a total 17 sailors dead. The disasters were found to be the direct consequence of incompetent commanders and ill-trained, uh, overworked, short-handed crews struggling to operate broken-down equipment that they did not know how to repair. The failures in leadership investigations revealed extended all the way to the top of the chain of command. The Army and Marines present a, 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 a hardly less depressing picture. 
For decades, the Army has been engaged in an expensive struggle to supply troops with reliable radios. One recent portable model, which uh, the Institute for Defense Analysis found would cost $72,000 each, was called the Man Pack. Not only is the Man Pack twice as heavy as the model it replaces, with a shorter range, but it has displayed a tendency to overheat and severely burn the unfortunate in in infantrymen carrying it. The helmets worn by soldiers and Marines in Iraq and Afghanistan have also been showing to be faulty. As the authors of the recent book, uh, Shattered Minds, have demonstrated, their design can actually amplify the effects of an explosion on one's brain. Therefore, many of the helmets have been found to be dangerously vulnerable to bullets and shrapnel thanks to a corrupt contractor skimping on the necessary bulletproofing material. As is common with those who speak up about official malpractice, the whistleblowers who exposed this particular fraud were viciously harassed by their superiors and driven out of their jobs. We're left with a fighting force that needs to rely on loved ones for vital needs such as armor and night vision goggles while we throw hundreds of millions of dollars at exotic contraptions such as the Compass Call Nova, a completely dysfunctional aircraft tasked with detecting improvised explosive devices. The pattern such boondoggles follow is predictable. The service insists that the new weapons are needed to replace our rapidly obsolescing fleets. Inevitably, unforeseeable and rapid enemy advances require new and more capable weapons, costing 50 to 100 percent more than their predecessors. The presumption that more capable weapons must cost more generally goes unquestioned, despite the fact that prices for more advanced personal computers and other civilian technologies have moved the opposite direction. Once budgets for an optimistically priced new weapon are approved by the Pentagon leadership and Congress, a program schedule is devised so that no single failure to meet a deadline or uh, pass a test can threaten the flow of funding. In addition, the contract, inevitably of crushing complexity, is designed to ensure that contractors get paid to cover any and all technical and management failures, which generally guarantees another doubling or tripling of the cost beyond the original inflated estimate. This process is little understood by the outside world, which is why taxpayers are prepared to accept a $143 million price tag on an F-22 fighter. That's just the Lockheed sticker. The real price per plane was over $400 million as somehow justified by its awesome technological capabilities. The late Ernest Fitzgerald, who was fired from his job as a senior Air Force cost management official on the direct orders of President Nixon for divulging excessive spending on an Air Force program, used to point out that $640 toilet seats and $435 hammers, uh, he was the first to bring these to the public's attention, um, were merely emblematic of a whole system and that items such as the $400 million fighter were no more reasonably priced than the toilet seats. The beauty of the system lies in the self-reinforcing nature. Huge cost overruns on these contracts not only secure a handsome profit for the contractor but also guarantee that the number of weapons acquired always falls short of the number originally requested. For example, the Air Force first planned to buy 750 F-22s at the projected cost of $139 million apiece. But the rising costs compelled the Defense Secretary at the time, Robert Gates, to cancel the program in 2009, capping the fleet at 187. With reduced numbers, weapon systems are kept in service longer, 
the Air Force planes average 28 years in service. And sometimes, still in use, uh, were built well over half a century ago. The F-35, for example, costs almost six times more than the F-16 it's replacing. Well, the Navy's um, uh, Zumwalt class destroyer, 7.5 billion each, cost four times more than the Arlai Burke destroyers. It was supposed to replace. The Zumwalt's overruns were so enormous that although the original plan called for 32 ships, production was cut to just three. On occasion, the system reaches the ultimate point of absurdity when gigantic sums are expended with no discernible results. Such was the case with the future combat systems of, um, of a grandiose Army program, field ground forces of managed vehicles linked via electronic networks. And um, with Boeing as the primary contractor, $20 billion later, the enterprise was shuttered, an extensive exercise in futility. Enormous outlays for marginal or even non-existent returns attract little attention, let alone objection, among our politicians. Congress routinely waves through the Pentagon's budgets with overwhelming bipartisan majorities. Part of the reason for this lies in the belief that the defense spending is bracing uh, is a bracing stimulant for the economy and for the home districts for the members of Congress. This point was spelled out with commendable clarity in a March New York Times op-ed by Peter Navarro, director of the White House of Trade and Manufacturing Policy. The occasion was Trump's impending visit to Lima, uh, an Ohio plant that manufactures the uh, United States Army's Abrams tank. Touting Donald Trump's role in expanding tank production, although the Army already has a huge surplus of tanks in storage, Navarro laid out the economic benefits for both Lima and Ohio, claiming the plant would employ more than 1,000 people there and thousands more across the nation. Consider, he wrote, the ripple effects of the Lima plant. In Ohio alone, 198 of its suppliers are spread out across the state's 16 congressional districts. Few elected representatives could miss the point, including the state's liberal representatives. Uh, it's liberal uh, Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown, who has worked alongside Republican lawmakers to boost funding for the project. Major contractors have turned the distribution of defense contracts across as many congressional districts as possible into an art. Contracts and subcontracts for Lockheed's F-35, for example, are spread across 307 congressional districts in 45 states, thus ensuring the fealty of a commensurate number of Congress people, as well as 90 senators. The jobs argument holds sway even when, in, uh, in a, when uh, an embrace of defense spending would seem to violate the alleged political principles. For example, the F-35 is due to be stationed at Vermont uh, at uh, Burlington International Airport, home to the Vermont National Guard. Because the F-35 is at least four times noisier than the F-16s it will replace, large swaths of surrounding low-cost neighborhood uh, by the Air Force's own criteria will be rendered unfit for residential use, trapping some 7,000 people in homes that will only be sellable at rock-bottom prices. Nevertheless, the F-35 proposal enjoys political support from the state's otherwise liberal elected leadership, notably Senator Bernie Sanders, who has justified his support on the grounds that, while he opposes the F-35, he supports its being stationed in Vermont from the perspective of jobs creation. Yet a deeper scrutiny indicates that defense contracts are not particularly efficient generators 
of jobs after all. Robert Pollan and Heidi Garrett Peltier of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst have calculated the number of jobs spawned by an investment of $1 billion in various industries, ranging from defense to health care, renewable energy and education. Education came in first by a wide margin producing 26,700 jobs, followed by health care at 17,200 jobs, defense generating, uh, generating 11,200 jobs ranked last. All economic activity creates some employment, Pollan told uh, the reporter. This isn't at issue. The relevant question is how much employment in the United States gets created for a given level of spending in one area of the economy as opposed to others. The fact is that defense spending generates fewer jobs than uh, green energy, education, and other critical industries. Studies such as these are rare. Research on the impact of defense spending on the United States economy as a whole are rarer still. Even though weapons account for about 10% of all U.S. factory output. A generation ago, Seymour Melvin, a professor of industrial engineering at Columbia, devoted much of his career to analyzing this very subject. He concluded that defense spending's impact on the broader economy was wholly harmful a consequence of the bad habits injected into the bloodstream of American manufacturing management by a defense culture indifferent to the cost control and productivity. The U.S. machine tool industry, for example, had powered post-war United States manufacturing dominance thanks to its cost-effective productivity that in turn allowed high wage rates for workers. But Melman wrote, as more and more of its output shifted to defense contracts, the industry's relationship with the Pentagon became uh, an invitation to discard the old tradition of cost minimizing. It was an invitation to avoid all the hard work that is needed to offset cost increases. For now, it was possible to cater to a new client for whom cost and price increase was acceptable even desirable. The consequence, as Melman detailed, uh, the U.S. machine tool industry gradually ceased to compete effectively with nations such as Germany and Japan, where cost control still reigns supreme. Of course, some sections of post-war U.S. manufacturing indebted uh, to defense dollars still led the world. Most notably, civilian aircraft is represented by the Boeing Company. The airliners that rolled out of its Seattle plant were well-designed, safe, and profitable. Boeing had a huge defense component as well, but senior management reportedly enforced an unwritten rule that managers from the defense side should never be transferred to the civilian arm, lest they infect it with their culture of cost overruns. Schedule, sli schedule slippage, and risky or unfeasible technical initiatives. Uh, that began to change in 1997 when Boeing merged with McDonnell Douglas, a defense company. Um, in management terms, the merger was, in effect, a McDonnell takeover, with its executives, most importantly CEO Harry Stonecipher, uh, assuming command of the combined company, bringing their cultural heritage with them. The effects were re uh, readily apparent in the first major Boeing airliner initiative under the uh, merged regime, the 787 Dreamliner, among other features familiar to any student of the defense industry. The program relied heavily on outsourcing subcontractors to foreign countries as a means of locking in foreign buyers. Shipping parts around the world obviously cost time and money, so the use of novel and potentially risky technologies, in this case, it involved a plastic airframe and an all-electric controls 
uh, powered by an extremely large and dangerous flammable battery. All of this had foreseeable effects on the plane's development schedule. And true to form for a defense program, it entered service three years late. This technology also had a typical impact on cost, which exceeded the initial development estimate of five billion dollars. Uh, it exceeded the cost by at least twelve billion. So the initial estimate five billion, and uh, and uh, it exceeded that cost by twelve billion. <clears throat> An impressive overrun, even by defense standards. Predictably, the battery did catch fire resulting in a costly three-month grounding of the Dreamliner fleet while a fix was devised. The plane has yet to show a profit for the corporation, but expects to do so eventually. The two recent crashes of the Boeing 737 MAX, which together killed 346 people, were further indications that uh, running a civilian programs along the defense industry lines may not have been the best course for Boeing. The 737 had been a tried and true moneymaker uh, with an impressive safety record since 1967. Several years ago, however, under the auspicious programs along defense industry lines may not have been the best course for Boeing. The 737 had been tried and trued as a money spinner with impressive safety records since 1967. Several years ago, however, under the auspices of CEO Dennis Muhlenberg, previous overseer of the future combat systems fiasco, and uh, Patrick Shanahan, currently the acting Secretary of Defense, who had headed up Boeing's missile defense systems and the Dreamliner program before becoming general manager of Boeing's commercial airplane programs. The airliner was modified into rushed production to uh, compete with the Airbus A320. These modifications, principally larger engines, uh, that uh, altered the plane's aerodynamic characteristics rendered it potentially unstable. Without informing customers or pilots, Boeing installed an automated, an automated software band-aid that fixed the stability problem, at least when the relevant sensors were working. But the sensors were liable to fail, with disastrous consequences. Such mishaps are not uncommon in the defense program. Such instance being Boeing's V-22 Osprey troop-carrying aircraft, supervised for a period by Shanahan, in which a design flaw, long denied, led to multiple crashes that killed 39 soldiers and Marines. But the impact of such disasters on contractors' bottom lines tend to be minimal, or even positive, since they may be paid to correct the problem they created. In the commercial market, the punishment in terms of lost sales and lawsuits are likely to be more severe. In the immediate aftermath of the Cold War, before tensions with Russia were reignited, the BDM Corporation, a major defense consulting group, received a Pentagon contract to interview former members of the Soviet defense complex, very senior officials either in the military or in the weapons production enterprises. Among the interesting revelations that emerged, which included confirmation that the United States intelligence assessments of Soviet, of Soviet defense policy had been almost entirely wrong throughout the Cold War, was an authoritative account of how disastrous the power of the military-industrial complex had been for Soviet defense and the economy. BDM learned that the defense industrial sector used its clout to deliver more weapons than the armed services asked for and to build new weapon systems that the operational military did not want. A huge portion of Soviet industrial capacity was devoted just to missile production. This vast industrial base, according to one former high-ranking bureaucrat, destroyed the national economy and pauperized the people. Calls for cuts in this unnecessary production were dismissed by the Kremlin leadership on the grounds what would happen to the workers. The unbearable burden of the Soviet military-industrial complex was undoubtedly a prime cause of the ultimate collapse of the Soviet state. The virus had consumed its host. 
The BDM contract had been issued in the belief that it would confirm a cherished Pentagon thesis that the sheer magnitude of U.S. spending, particularly the huge boost initiated in the Reagan years, had brought down the Soviets by forcing them to compete a welcome endorsement for a mammoth defense budget. But the ongoing BDM project, even before the researchers finished their work, made it clear this was not what happened. The Soviet burden was entirely self-generated for internal reasons, such as maintaining employment. When Pentagon officials realized that BDM's research was leading towards a highly unwelcome conclusion, the contract was abruptly terminated. The system knows how to defend itself. Again, this is uh, a review of Andrew Cockburn's uh, Military Industrial Virus, uh, and he is the editor of Harper's Magazine and the author, most recently, of Kill Chain, The Rise of High-Tech Assassins. I'm David Sandbeck, running for Congress in Minnesota's 4th Congressional District. Thank you.